Pittsburgh Surf Farm. I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about myself and how this farm came to be. Um, I moved to Montana to retire about eight and a half years ago, and um, it took me several years to find a place I wanted to live. And I've always had a garden in the backyard, and I had stuff going on in my life where I decided I was going to be a plant person instead of a people person. And, my land suited me very well to be a reclusive permit type of person. And I did that for several years and dug into the dirt lots. And um, after a couple of years of doing that, I um, I heard a voice that told me that I had it was time for me to let I literally said, I've healed you. Now it's time for you to let me heal others. And um, I was furious. This was my sanctuary, my retreat, my refuge. And, but I knew better than to not listen to that voice. And I went about opening my land and cutting down trees and making a bigger garden. During the course of the next uh, several years, including up until last year, which is about a um, five-year process, people say, Wendy, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. And at one point, somebody said to me, well, you've got to have some key elements in what you're doing. And um, I'm a healing arts practitioner by profession. Um, at that time, I had just been to the Montana Organic Association's conference, and a man who presented, um, a guy who taught agriculture in, uh, in um, Idaho, said was connecting the dots between quality of soil see quality of plant, quality of food, quality of health in a person, and quality of health in communities. And he finished up his presentation by saying, what you farmers need to be doing is you need to be creating health spas on your land. And went, bing! <laughs> you know, because I was already kind of doing that. I had my healing arts practice. I had this growing farm. And um, so with that, I moved into um, full-scale um, clarity, a lot greater clarity about what I was doing. And I had decided a couple of years earlier to grow herbs, not because I knew anything about them, because I don't, and I still only know a little, but because I have a son who's a clinical herbalist and a uh, naturopathic physician, and he was eager to have a source of uh, good medicine. And also because as I looked at the farms in the valley, I was going, what, what's my niche? What would be my niche? And so herbs felt like would be a good niche for me. I'm, you know, I'm 67 years old. I'm not getting any younger. And I felt like if I could grow a lot in a little that would have value, then that would be a good niche. Um, back to the key elements piece, um, I realized that the herbs um, and learning about them and learning about farming was a big part of what was happening for the hoofers who came to my farm. And I was always trying to kind of sneak something in there about health building practices that I felt would help them um, to be able to share with, with people they knew in their life and also for their own personal growth and development. So these key elements, um, as I sat, what are the key elements, um, are farming, learning, and growing health. And and then, you know, just to be totally cool, everybody needs to have, a, you know, if you're into herbs and you start studying herb gardens, you'll see that there's all different kinds of layouts and designs, and um, the cool thing seems to be to come up with an herbal mandala. And this that you see on all of our t-shirts is the design that um, uh, kind of grabbed me the most. It's a Celtic, it's called a Celtic Triskelion. Is their spiral of life. And Celtic culture is an earth-based culture. This symbol you'll see represented in, as you see it on us, and you'll also see it in its mirror image. In the mirror image, it's all about connecting from the earth plane to spirit. In this, in the way we, the way it is on our land, and 
um, the way you see it here, it's all about bringing spirit down into form. And that has been a, um, a lifelong thing for me about how to bring spiritual intuition and guidance and visions into the, um, to manifest them in the physical world. And that's what you see here on our land. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole long thing about the physical land unless there's time to do so at all, but there's three major spirals there. They're, they're oriented in a resonant relationship with the, the directions of um, east, south, and northwest. And, um, and the herbs that are connecting from the inside of one spiral to the outside of the adjacent spiral have resonant energies for the elements that they're connecting, whether it be learning to farming, farming to building health, or health to the learning. Um, so that's a context for a lot of what we do. Um, I have been inviting for several years young people to come and learn and grow with me. And um, and we have, and it's obvious that what's happening is that we grow more than plants. We grow ourselves as people, and we grow in relationship to each other in the communities that we build and develop. Um, in order to do that well, um, we've created a set of standards that we live by. If you're curious to see what they are, they're all over the website. They're um, they're in the book down on our table downstairs. Our herbal presentation today, from seed to sap, um, is going to be continued by the seven interns who are currently on my land. The minimum uh, stay right now is about seven and a half weeks, and most of these um, incredible beings are going to be with me until the end of October. Um, so their presentation will focus on the identification of medicinal, uh, a each person a medicinal and culinary herb and their uses. And everybody has some unique tidbit to share. These are not comprehensive herbal monologues, um, monographs. They're you know just a snippet, and um, I will let you know how you can get more at the end. So, yay! Next. Good afternoon, my name is Lena. I'm from Great Falls, Montana, and I'm excited to be here to have the opportunity to speak to you today about a flower, an edible flower that I was introduced to in a dream. I saw it and I I saw it and I didn't know how to pronounce it, so I was mispronouncing it. Calendula until I was corrected by a friend. So I went out and I bought a multicolored flowering plant, planted it in a flower bed, and it flourished easily. The more I harvested the flower tops, the more they grew, and the orange flowers of the calendula have the highest medicinal qualities. And I would suggest cutting the flowers of the orange flowers if you want more orange flowers to grow. After harvesting, I dried them, stored in a paper bag until they were used to make a salve. And I used the salve on my lips, face, hands, and I used them on the ends of my hair. <coughs> I don't cut the ends of my hair. I don't have split ends. So I think that you can moisturize your hair with any type of salve, especially one that's made for your skin and your hair and your nails, and uh, you won't have to cut your hair either. So the leaves of the calendula, are spatula seeds. They're soft and they're fuzzy. The flower petals spread out numerously like the rays of the sun and come in colors white, yellow, and orange. Calendula is native to North Africa, Southwestern Asia, the Mediterranean, and Central Europe. It is now widely cultivated in the U.S. and is commonly grown as a garden annual. Calendula is found on Spirit Works Herb Farm surrounding the medicinal mandala, which Lindy spoke of, and it surrounds it as a barrier and a covering, acting much like skin would on the body. So calendula grows well in both full sun and part shade. It can be planted in a pot or directly in the ground in moderately fertile soil, including clay, and can survive cool summers. 
the large curved seeds can or should be sown a quarter inch deep. Harvest flower tops the calends or first days of the month, beginning early spring and throughout the summer. Dry the flower to use in an infusion tincture or for direct external or internal use. These can also be dried and used as a bitter tonic. Calendula is therapeutic for the limb system, the respiration, digestion, and female functionalities, and all issues of the skin. There are no known contraindications or warnings with calendula. Um, it does have a long history as a food, sweet, fresh petals thrown into soups and salad, and is generally regarded as safe. Emotionally, calendula is good for heavy depression, mentally uplifting, and has a positive psychological effect, especially for people with fear of cancer. It is both drying and moisturizing in different situations, and it is considered warming. The directional association is in the east due to its strong relationship with the sun. The leaves are bitter and salty, and they have high levels of organic iodine, which give it strong antiseptic qualities. And I wanted to include something about iodine because it's a controversial uh, mineral, um, and it feeds the thyroid and uh, your full endocrine system, helping detoxify, but also protect your body from viruses, bacteria, you name it. I take five drops of iodine on an empty stomach and a little bit of water first thing in the morning, and it's probably something I'm going to take for a lifetime. Folklore tells us that calendula corresponds with prophetic dreams, protection, respect, and legal matters. It's a plan of happiness and joy, something we would like to share with you today. So those of us at the farm have bags and calendula seeds, and they will be in a basket by the door. Thank you very much. five years and I've been studying herbalism for the past couple of years around the country and um, now I'm in Montana so thank you for having me. Um, uh, I picked St. John's work uh, because it's actually um, a very special plant to me because it was the first plant that I had wild crafted. So just curious when I say wild crafted do people can you show a raise of hands um, what if people understand that term in general? Okay, good. Um, so wild crafted just means that it's out in the wild. You could be walking down a trail, you can see it. Um, you can plant your garden, but you didn't actually plant that thing. Um, and so it's wild in that sense. So wild crafting is when you go out, you find something that grows naturally, and uh, you can take there, bring it home and make a medicine out of it. So, um, and a lot of them locally, it's actually a noxious weed. So you um, really wouldn't be planting it in your garden, but it looks like that. <laughs> Um, so, and it blooms during the summer solstice, so if you're ever wondering how you can find this plant, um, really look around the summer solstice time, and you'll see these yellow flowers. Um, it likes to grow in on damaged land, and a lot of times you'll see it on the side of um, roads, which I think is really a nice indication of what this plant can do, because it really heals that damaged land, and um, when we take it as a medicine, it does the same for our bodies. Okay, so there's a few ways to prepare this herb um, when you do find it. Um, do, do people know what a tincture is? Okay, um, for those of you who don't, tincture just meaning that you would put the flowering top into some type of alcohol. You strain it out and then you take it internally. So that's one way to prepare this. And um, this herb likes to be prepared fresh. So people get really excited around um, this time of year. So find some friends and um, find this plant. And uh, when you make your tincture, um, it's really useful for our mild to moderate depression, which is the most common use that we've heard about St. John's work. Um, seasonal affective disorder, it's helpful for. It's also a nervine, meaning that it calms the nervous system. Um, and it also treats damage to the nerves and chronic pain due to nervous exhaustion. So it's a very helpful herb. <coughs> um, and that's uh, tincture, so internally. And then also, the reason, one of the reasons I love this plant is it makes the most beautiful red oil. Um, 
So this is what the oil looks like. And this is from the flowering tops and the buds. Um, this is avocado oil and um, extra virgin olive oil. And this one likes to be set out in the sun because it's a sun plant. Summer solstice is yellow. It wants to be in the sun. And that's how that oil turns vibrant red. And with this oil, when you are interested in making salves, meaning that it just has something, um, a thickening agent in it, uh, you use the oil and it's some type of thickening agent. This is coconut oil, so the color's a little bit different, um, but I infused uh, St. John's with the just straight coconut oil, and uh, that is good for topical use. Um, it's good for nerve pain, like I said, um, inflammation, deep wounds, bruises, and strains. And so I use a lot as a massage therapist um, uh, that a lot of people have these issues. So it's a really nice thing to have around the house. Um, if you are working with nerve pain, which is like one of the most common uses for this, it's good to take internally the whole plant and also use the topical oil. Um, yes. Energetically, the herb affects our solar plexus, meaning like our digestive or core or center. Um, so people who suffer from poor digestion, anxiety, and a lot of self-doubt may benefit from using this herb. Um, and it helps to bring a more calm and centered presence to the body. Uh, one of my favorite things are flower essences. Um, when a flower is just kind of infused into water, among other things, but it's called a flower essence. Um, and this helps a person find their own inner strength for people who feel overly vulnerable and fearful. So it's a nice ally to have. Um, it's great for people who um, experience negative dreams or anxiety in their dreams. And children, uh, using flower essences with your children, if they have nightmares, um, they are gentle enough, and they're very powerful as well. So hopefully with the yellow and the summer solstice, you get the idea that this is um, a bringer of light, and it really brings light to like the deep wounds of disconnection and darkness, and um, the spiritual lesson as to anchor the spiritual sun as a source within rather than outside the self. So it's a very powerful ally. And um, look for it this summer, grab some friends, and wildcraft this herb. Make beautiful oil. If anyone wants to look at it, you can come up and smell it. So, mugwort is a plant I'll be sharing some knowledge about today, and its botanical name is Artemisia vulgaris, and what initially ignited my interest in this plant was um, the origin of its name. And Artemisia comes from Artemis, the Greek goddess of the moon. Um, she's a goddess of nature, of wilderness, of hunt, and she's known as a protector. So um, this plant is native to Asia, but now it's, find, it's found um, throughout the world. It's very prolific. Um, it grows in spirit works in our farm, and also um, throughout the nation. It's an aromatic perennial, and it has a silvery green color, and I'll pass these around so you can look at them. So um, it's got a dark silvery color, dark green silvery color and um, it's commonly found near roadsides or riverbanks because it really <coughs> likes being in water, near water. Um, again, the association to the moon and the cycles of nature. <coughs> as well as, um, so it likes water and it'll like sand sandier soil instead of really nice soil you would use in your garden. So if you would like to propagate this plant, um, you can surface sow it in the late winter, or you can do a basal cutting, and it will do really well. It resists frost and drought, and um, it's only um, really important requirement is sunlight. <coughs> so um, culinary and medicinally, the parts to use of this plant are the leaves and the flowers. So on the left hand side uh, are the, the flowers, and on the right, the leaves. And 
it's typically harvested around August. It's the optimum optimal time. So culinarily, um, it is used in European kitchens uh, as poultry stuffing or as tea, and it's also uh, been used in herbal vinegars. Could you speak up just a little bit? Yes, Thank I you. can. And um, in England, its flowers um, are typically used to make hop beers, so it's combined with hops to make um, beer. And I'm uh, going into the medicinal aspect of it. Uh, it is antispasmodic, it is coloretic, which means it helps with um, liver function. It is antimicrobial and anemenagogue. And anemenagogue um, means it's a tonic for the reproductive female system. And uh, it promotes, promotes the menses. So if you're not getting it in time, it will just help you. And mugwort can be uh, infused into the oil to make a salad. Um, I've used uh, sesame oil as it's a warming oil and it'll help with the pain. And I've combined it with sage and cedarwood essential oil and beeswax. And um, internally, it can be taken as a tea also to help with menstrual pain. And it has been commonly combined with plant bark or with ginger and honey oil. It also stimulates the circulatory system and it's <coughs> been used in ancient times and traditional Chinese medicine to treat um, circulation problems because it's such a warming, it's a, it's a mildly warming plant. And in traditional <coughs> Chinese medicine, it's used in a treatment called moxification, which the ashes burnt into certain points of the body <coughs> that are associated with um, circulation and overall well-being. And it is also used as a bitter and um, at times used for loss of appetite or in cases of candida. And spiritually, it's used. Uh, it's been used in native cultures uh, and purification rituals, so just smudging, um, as if you would with sage or another purification plant. The two contraindications I found um, are that they are not appropriate for pregnant women. Um, although I found some books that didn't even mention it, I did find it as a common concern. Um, or if it's taken excessively, which would be more than about three tablespoons a day of tea internally, um, it could cause some irritation in the gastrointestinal tract. And yeah, that's the information I have to share with you today. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Okay, hi everybody. Is everyone having a good day? This is a great event, isn't it? Yeah, I'm having a good time. Okay, well my name is Kyle. I was born and raised in upstate New York. Um, I wasn't born a farmer. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about mullein. This is a plant that is known in pretty wide known areas um, to grow. And I formed this connection with Mullen when I started farming about four years ago, and I was instructed to, to remove this plant because it was considered a weed. And after weeks, months of doing this, I'm thinking, what is this? But, you know, there's got to be a reason that we're being told to remove this, and um, only will come to find out that it is a medicinal, very medicinal plant. So I'm going to help you guys be able to identify it in the wild. It, um, it's a pretty distinct plant, and one of the main features to tell it apart from any other one is the texture. If you feel it when it's growing in the ground, it's got a really fuzzy texture. Little tiny hairs are growing off of it, and um, here's a picture of it going to seed. It has a beautiful goldenrod-like flower, and um, these are the seeds. And. Yeah, the flowers here are mainly used to make infusions or salves. Um, there's a recipe here for an ear oil. It's known to heal earaches and any ear infections. And um, that's just a simple 
with these flowers, you would mix it with garlic juice, lobelia, and any kind of carrier oil. You would just soak that for about a week or so and then strain it off and use it as you'd like. It's, um, the healing properties are very restorative. They regenerate damaged tissue cells and it can be applied topically to minor wounds, cuts, scrapes, sores, any kind of skin irritation. And um, it heals. Wounds a very powerful plant. So, a little scientific um, properties about it. There's some chemical compounds that are known to, to ease pain and soothe nerve endings, reduce inflammation. So these are called anodyne and allantone. I don't know what that means very much, but they're pretty cool to know that that's what they do. Um, at the same time, mullein possesses a lot of mucologinous properties, so it helps clear mucus. You can make a tea, and it really, actually, I just made some mullein tea yesterday, and it cleared my sore throat up. So I swear by it. It's a very, uh, very powerful plant. It's very grounding. When you go to pull it out of the ground, it's going to have some resistance because the root, it's a deep root of the plant. And it's like a mass. You pull it up and it's just like a massive root. How does this work? You know? So it's a pretty incredible plant. Um, yeah, that's pretty much that. I just want to end with a quote from an author of the Herbal Holman Remedy book. She says, with Moline, intent is everything. It's used to make magic and protect from magic. So yeah, look out for it. Instead of pulling it out of the ground, if you just cut it off and you lay it around the ground underneath your plant, on your um, underneath your trees and your plants, it does the same thing to the soils as it does to your body. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful to regenerate the soils around plants. Mm -hmm. Thank you so don't that. dig up the plant. Keep yeah. it growing and just cut it off. Mm -hmm. Farmers consider it a weed because each stem has a couple of hundred thousand seeds. Mm -hmm. And when you get one mullein, two years later you've got a thousand, and two years after that you've got ten thousand. And they colonize whole pastures. Which is why generally we tend to remove it. Right, yeah, in the eastern states of New York it's pretty much accepted as just a weed. And you right. see it everywhere, you see it growing on the ground, it's everywhere. Can you do containers or to control it? Sure, yeah, you can propagate it, totally. You maybe plant it about a foot apart. <laughs> but can you container garden it though to keep it from? Like do it in a raised bed to stop it from spreading? She's talking about it, it, the roots are too big. The, the roots go down pretty cool. It's good to play with it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We're going we're gonna to hold the rest of the questions and discussion to the end. And um, Who's next? Sorry to put all the questions about Mullen on hold, I know it's <laughs> but I'd like to share a different one with you. <laughs> okay. Space bar. Okay. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Marina. Um, and the plant that I would like to share some information with you about today is one that is very, very common and well known, um, probably even more so than Mullen. Um, however, it's mostly not very well known as a medicinal plant, which is one of the reasons I chose it today. And that plant is cayenne pepper. So, cayenne. Um, most of you are probably familiar with it already as a culinary spice. It's very common across the world. Um, it's native to North America, and it's been used both culinarily and medicinally for over 9,000 years, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so it's a low-growing perennial, it kind of gets bushy, it has um, brilliant red fruits, or peppers. So this is one that was grown at Spirit Works that I'm going to pass around, in case anyone hasn't gotten a chance to actually see what cayenne like pepper fruit looks like. Uh, so it does well in greenhouses because it needs to get very hot to have those um, compounds that give it a fighting flavor and also that make it medicinally valuable. So the name, um, Latin name of cayenne is Capsicum annuum, or annuus, I found both. And uh, Capsicum is from Greek to bite, so it has that really like sharp and pungent um, effect, which probably most of you are familiar with if you've ever taken a bite of anything with a lot of cayenne pepper in it. So, um, 
Um, the two main things that it does medicinally depend on how you take it. So one of them is internal. And if you take it internally, then it has this really warming and stimulating quality. So it works very well, in particular, on circulation and on your blood. And what it does is it helps to strengthen and equalize the circulation, in particular if you're concerned about heart attacks. There's actually been some research and um, some effectiveness so you can take cayenne internally if, you have, if you're having a heart attack, and that's actually been shown to stop it sometimes, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it also just really gets your blood flowing. It's got that very stimulating effect. If you can imagine just like taking a <coughs> cayenne, you can just, like, imagine how that would really get you going. And it's often combined with other herbs for that reason, because it helps to work as a catalyst, meaning that it diffuses the effects of other herbs throughout the body and helps make them stronger. So it's often very commonly combined with herbs that support the immune system and respiratory illness so that they can be stronger in combination with cayenne. It also um, helps to stimulate the appetite. So if you're having a weak or, um, or lack, weak appetite or just lack of interest in food, then taking some cayenne can help to get that going and can help to get everything moving properly. So it really has that amazing ability to just get everything going and make everything um, run the way it should. So that's internally. Externally, um, it has two main qualities that it does. One of them is you can use it for wound care, for bleeding. So it's often actually something that's recommended for like survivalist first aid kits is to have cayenne pepper, because you can put it on a bleeding wound and it's anti-hemorrhagic, meaning that it will actually stop significant bleeding. Uh, the other thing that it can do is to help with pain. So here in this little jar, I have an example of cayenne salve that we made at Spirit Works. And I'm going to pass it around so everybody can try it if you would like to. Before I do that, I want to put out a couple words of warning. So as you know, cayenne is very strongly spicy, so it's best to avoid contact with mucous membranes. So if you apply it to your skin, make sure you don't go to then rub your eye because you're going to have a painful experience, which is the opposite of what's it, what it's intended to do. It also sometimes doesn't wash off the skin very well. So one thing that's helpful is because it's not very water soluble, it can be hard to scrub it off, but you can actually use vinegar and that helps wash it off much more easily. So if you're trying this, just be careful. Don't touch your eyes or the inside of your nose or any other mucous membranes that I don't really want to know about. <laughs> um, after you do that. And the other thing is that because it does have a pretty strong red color, it can possibly stain your clothing. So just be careful with that. So, however, this has been tested by all of us at Spirit Works. It's not painful to apply unless you apply it to your mucous membranes. So I'm going to pass that around if anybody would like to try it. Can you bring the antidote? Can you bring vinegar? <laughs> not bring vinegar. Um, but so uh, the salve is a great way of treating arthritis in particular. So if you apply it long term, like uh, for a week or more, then it's been really shown to help with joint pain. It can also help with bruises, with sore muscles, um, with cuts. A couple of us tried it out yesterday after shoveling out quite a bit of uh, chicken coop. Um, leavings. And, <laughs> it was, and it was very helpful. And like I've applied it to bruises and it helped with that as well. So um, so it really has some pretty amazing qualities, even though it's a, a common plant that most people wouldn't think of. So culinarily is how most people are probably familiar with it. And uh, a word about the medicinal um, interactions of cayenne when you use it culinarily. So you can still get a lot of health benefits out of it from cooking out with it. However, um, the heat destroys some of the medicinal compounds, so it's still beneficial, but if you're trying to use it strictly medicinally, then it's better to not cook it, and instead to use it, in, for instance, um, an infused vinegar or an infused oil, you could use it as a salad dressing. Uh, so I hope that you're feeling a little bit inspired to use some more cayenne in your life. Maybe you're not the biggest fan of spice, but there's other ways to use it, even if you don't want to have a spicy tongue. And so maybe the next time you have a wound or are feeling like you need something to get you going, you can reach for your, your spice cabinet. Before I close, I just wanted to share one quote about cayenne from Dr. Richard, Richard Schultz. It is, if you master only one herb in your life, master cayenne pepper. It's more powerful than anything else.
want to make sure we have time for the rest of us to go. But did you have a, a question? I just want to say that it does really um, work to stop um, bleeding. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really very good. Thank you. And if you're interested in the Cayenne Sab, that's one of the things that you might get if you sign up for Herbal CSAs, and we'll be doing that um, starting in May. If you do soak the seeds, soak the leaves, or soak the pamper, the whole pamper. Um, so that was just powdered cayenne. So like, like you could buy at any grocery store, and that was infused in avocado oil, and then. Um, melted with some beeswax to give and to use it um, as a thickening agent so that it is solid. So you use avocado oil with beeswax to give it a settling, a more of a... No, the beeswax is added after the oil is infused. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, and I'm here to talk about the herb thyme. And or thyme is also known as garden thyme or common thyme, and botanically it's also called thymus vulgaris. And what I found interesting about thyme is that it's a very common herb used in culinary, and you use it for soup, sauces, to add flavor to anything else. And but medicinally, it has a lot of benefits that a lot of people don't know about. Um, it actually contains a chemical compound called thymol that has strong antibacterial properties, which can combat intestinal parasites and staph infections, and it is used a lot in mouthwashes to eliminate bacteria and many other uses. Um, it's also really good for the respiratory tract, and it clears pathways to ease bronchitis, emphysema, asthma, or any other complications with that. And I actually found a really good recipe that includes thyme oil. Um, it's thyme honey cough syrup, and it only takes about 10 minutes to make. It is two cups of water, three tablespoons of organic, fresh, or dried thyme, and one cup of raw organic honey. And you just bring the water to a boil, then add the thyme, and cover and let sit for about 10 minutes, or until it's cool, strain, and then whisk in the honey until it's dissolved. And you can keep that in your fridge for about two months, so it's good all through cold season, pretty much. And if you're looking to find thyme, you can find it in many parts of the country, all over, in any temperate climate. It's actually a cultivated form of wild thyme that was originally found in Spain and other European countries around the Mediterranean. Um, and if you're looking for it there, you can find it's a perennial with a round, hard stem, growing usually four to eight inches high. It can grow up to 12 inches um, at the highest with very tiny gray-green leaves. So if you're looking for to use thyme for something besides just using in your food, you can use it for respiratory infections, or anything with antibacterial needs. It is, it's a cough Yeah, it is two cups of water, three tablespoons of organic fresh or dry thyme, and then one cup of raw organic honey, and you bring the water to a boil, at the time, cover and let sit until cool, about 10 minutes. And then you whisk in the honey until it's dissolved, and then you store it in your fridge. And it can last for about two months. native to the Mediterranean region. It does not grow wildly in Montana, although it can be planted in your garden at home, as many people do. Um, culinary sage goes well with roasted meats, fish, potatoes, and can be added to sauces for a warm flavor. It has an astringent flavor profile and is one of the most popular herbs in the United States. A few other herbs that pair well with sage are rosemary, thyme, coriander, and it is great with garlic. 
Um, the leaves should be harvested from the top portion of the plant. When you harvest from the bottom, the new leaves will not grow, so make sure to get the mature leaves from the top. They can also be planted near um, big rocks to attract more sunlight. It likes a lot of sun and well-draining soil. And they will also help to keep it warm overnight. Um, so when you have your leaves harvested, you can dry them out and they can be used as a seasoning or in tea. And sage tea is used medicinally and can relieve sore throat, regulate high blood sugar for those with diabetes, relieve indigestion, reduce heavy menstruation, and can help to clear a sinus infection because of eucalyptol, which kills bacteria. Um, once the tea is cooled, it can be applied to wounds and rashes. Uh, sage oil can help to improve memory. In a study, it was proven that individuals <coughs> that took the oil had improved recall and attention. Culinary sage contains thujone. This chemical increases heart rate and can cause mental confusion when consumed in large amounts. I found a website called healwithfood.org and they had an informational article about thujone. And I have a few quotes from their site. Um, consumption of this common kitchen herb in normal food amounts is not likely to cause any serious side effects. <coughs> About three to six cups of sage tea could be consumed daily without reaching to toxicological thresholds. Unless you have an existing condition, especially one that affects the kidneys or the liver, or if you're taking some medications that may interact with thujone or other compounds naturally present in sage, Using sage to add Mediterranean flavor to your culinary creations and drinking sage tea in its moderation are unlikely to cause any major adverse reactions. In fact, you may be doing your body a real favor. So I recommend using sage in your cooking or taking a sage tea if you have a sore throat, it really does the trick. So uh, one of the challenges I had as the owner of a medicinal herb farm who didn't know anything about herbs was how to um, create meaningful experiences for people who came here knowing that they uh, were not going to be working with a clinical herbalist, but they were going to be working with an herb grower. I am blessed with green thumb, I can grow most anything, and um, I'm able to address the how to grow piece part. And the plants um, themselves provide an experiential, educational aspect. There's nothing like spending about three hours uh, in a patch of lemon balm to get a sense of what lemon balm's about. And, um, and then, uh, so one of the things I did is I created the library. And I, I select my interns on the basis of people who are self-directed learners, not people who are asking me to be their herbal encyclopedia, but people who really want to come and connect the dots between the, the personal experience that they have with a, with a plant, with what that plant's about based from what other people know. And in order to um, bring that those individual experiences into community every week, somebody Every person researches an herb, does a write-up on it, um, has experiential relationships with it that are then shared with the rest of the group. And in order to bring the, the, the benefit of that to our community, we have herb classes every, Monday, every Tuesday at 11 o'clock when um, we share what we're exploring and um, the experiences can be diverse. It can be come out and leave lemon balm with us for, for an hour, and then we'll go in and talk about it. Um, and talk first about what our experiences are, and then go into what we've learned and what we know. Um, so, my descendant, John Dewey, who was a philosopher back in the turn of the last century, who talked a lot about education by experience, and somehow that gene just kind of came through loud and clear that 
we learn by what we experience rather than by um, uh, hope that. Um, this year, we're, we'll, um, we're really launching our farm as, as um, a resource for our community. We'll be have a open farm store on Fridays where people who subscribe to the Herbal CSA can come and pick up their their herbs for the week, or they can also pick them up at the Kalispell or the Columbia Falls Farmers Markets um, Thursday and Saturday. Um, in there, our CSAs will be selling seeds, plants, fresh and dried herbs, herbal products, teas, salves, lotions, oils, and recipes we enjoy. Um, and it's going to be set up pretty much so every week's a surprise because we don't know what, what it is that we're going to decide that we want to include in it. But it's roughly uh, a little bit more than 10 to $12 worth of product. Um, and it's over 19 weeks, and we're um, offering that for $200 subscriptions. In, in addition, um, we, we grow strawberries. We have a strawberry pre-buy bulk order um, offering. And these strawberries have been grown organically for the last several years. By the time they bloom this year, they'll be certified organic. We're in the process of going through that process right now. Um, the farm store may also have other vegetables that are in season that are surplus from what we need for our own consumption and uh, for putting by for people who show up in the middle of February. We also have a um, expanding flock of heritage breed chickens, um, much loved, much adored, much to teach us um, from the diversity of the flock. Um, and, and they give us multicolored eggs that will be available, that are available anytime at the Midway Mini Mart or Fridays at the farm. Um, we, we are also, um, because I'm, we're set up as an educational venue, Right now, we're, we're offering a lot of different kinds of classes. We're in the approaching class three in beekeeping, uh, working with a good bee company on that. And that class is, has just been off the charts informative for anybody who wants to know more about bees. We will be repeating it in April as a one, um, one day or one weekend workshop instead of spanning it over three, um, over six weeks or every other weekend. Um, it, just, I gotta tell you, I'm just having so much fun because I run into somebody I haven't seen for a while. I say, What are you doing? And I go, You know, sounds like you might want to share that. And so there is going to be a wide spectrum of offerings, some of which I know about, some of which are, are just in the formative stages. Um, we will be posting those on our website. If you want to receive informational emails about that, all you have to do is go to our website, which is spiritworksherbs.com. And in the upper right hand corner, you can subscribe to the website notifications of the events that are happening. Um, so, um, we welcome people out to the farm by appointment or anytime on Fridays. And um, we look forward to seeing you sometime this season. Hope you come and learn with us. Um, there are other things we've got in the pipeline that. Um, aren't well enough formed yet for me to start to talk about them, but I hope you'll follow us through our website and be able to participate. Are there any questions, um, either for me or to the to individual presenters? Yes. I'm sorry, I've got wacky eyes. If I look at you, I'm in point just because I'm looking at you, but you think I'm looking at you, so oh, excuse me. Um, what herbs are we best for like now? Um, I do not make pres prescriptive recommendations about herbs. However, um, Jolene Barsh is here, and you can maybe talk to her. And there are several other clinical herbalists are, who are here today and have those. And, um, and I can encourage you to also sometimes Google it. 
but I cannot recommend that you dive into the herbal world without a knowledgeable ally, whether it be a clinical herbalist, a naturopathic physician, or a medical doctor that's knowledgeable about that. Thank you for asking. And don't forget your seeds on your way out. Okay. Yes, we. Uh, this is this is spreading the joy. Um, those cool to get back to it, but, um, yes, another question. No, just a comment. Your presentations were so awesome, inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> really jumped up from wherever they came from into the fire that, that and um, four people have only been here for, for this is their third day here so it really is quite an accomplishment that they did Yes. Um, I was just wondering what you find to be the most effective method for making infused oils for cells um, I, I'm, I prefer using my oils in the sun when I harvest the herb, um, the, bio, the biological part of the plant that I'm going to use. I put it in oil on my back porch during the warm weather and let the sun do it. Uh, and you'll see pictures on Facebook of what happens when you do it that way. It, it's like there's these energy orbs and little just packets of energy. You can feel the energetic vibration of what happens when the sun interacts with the oil and the plant. Um, that's my preferred way. Okay, thank you. Um, who asked that? I did. Uh, the few things that I've noticed, so if you do put it outside in the sun, which like um, Lindy was saying, some plants really enjoy the sun, uh, you can double layer like cheesecloth and make sure that that's tight so things, um, bugs and stuff don't get in and out. Because if you cap it tightly, like a mason jar, then like the um, the condensation, like the water, can get into there, and then you'll start to see like the bacteria problem. Okay, so that's pretty much the two. But you can do it either way. Okay, I just yeah. Thanks. Just make sure you cover it. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like different, like.